One of the things I love about programming in R is that there's a phenomenal community of R programmers out there ready and willing to help you if you ask a question. And so there are a variety of discussion forums out there where you can get help. So Stack Overflow is definitely a uh, viable candidate. Another great candidate is the community forum that is hosted by RStudio. Now, Stack Overflow tends to have a bit of a reputation for not being uh, super nurturing, right? <laughs> There's a lot of programmers and dudes that just want to tell you how smart they are. There are certainly some very smart and very, very helpful people over there, but eh, it tends to be a little bit of a caustic environment. I found that the discussion forum hosted by RStudio is actually fairly nurturing and does a really good job of helping people at all levels of programming ability. So we can ask questions on these discussion forums, but the challenge becomes, who's gonna answer these questions? Well, in today's episode, I'm going to show you what makes for a good question on one of these discussion forums, and then how I go about answering questions that people have. Over here at community.rstudio.com, you can see the discussion forum that they are hosting. Uh, it's basically laid out where people will ask questions and they title their questions. Perhaps they tag it. You know, here you've got some for machine learning and modeling, Shiny, General, um, RStudio, um, whatnot. Um, and then you've got an indication of how many people are involved in this ongoing discussion, um, how, how long um, it's been up there, how long it has been since the person asked the question. And so one of the questions that caught my eye was this post on black border around certain points in ggplot. And so what caught my eye was that this had the question with the name ggplot in it. And so that initially cued me that, hey, Pat, you know something about ggplot. Maybe that uh, is something that you could answer. And when I saw black border around certain points, that also um, piqued my interest because I know there are certain plotting symbols where you can actually change the border of the symbol to be a different color than the inside of the plotting symbol. And so this is the question that I wanna take on and show you what I think of the question, kind of my critique of their question, and then I'm gonna go about showing you how I would solve this problem. We talked about the title, it's descriptive, it gets my attention, it put in a keyword there that, you know, is something that triggered an idea for me that I realized I could answer this, so it drew me in, right? So C right one, I don't know who they are, but their question is I'm plotting some data using ggplot2. The data has several different colors and a few different shapes, right? So one variable is being mapped to the color aesthetic and one variable is being mapped to the shape aesthetic. They wanna put a black border only around the circles and triangles, but they wanna leave the squares to not have a border. So basically what they say is that we need something like scale border manual if there's anything that existed like that, um, to be able to control what shapes get a border and which ones don't. So we will not be able to find scale border manual, but we'll work up a trick that will allow us to get the result that I think they're after. One of the great things about this post is that they put in a minimal reproducible example, a minimal reprex. And so there's two lines of code here, can't get too much more minimal than that, and then they show the output. What would be really nice that they didn't do would be to show what they want it to look like, right? So they could take this PNG image and they could then perhaps go into PowerPoint or something and kind of draw onto it what they want those square symbols to look like versus the circles and the triangles. But I think I know what they're after here. So on the whole, I think this is a pretty good uh, question and I'm gonna go over to our studio. I'm gonna copy this code and we're gonna make sure we can reproduce it and then I'm gonna show you how we can achieve the result that I think they're after. Here in our studio, I'll open up a new R script and I'll paste in that code that they posted onto the discussion forum. I'll do library tidyverse, make sure that loads. And then I'll go ahead and run their code to make sure that I get the result that they had in their discussion post. And this plot looks identical to what they had and so we're in good shape to go. I'm going to go ahead and clean up their aesthetics a little bit so it doesn't go off the right side of my screen. One thing I want to point out about this minimal reproducible example is that they're using a data set called MT Cars. MT Cars comes pre-baked into R and it is a data frame. I think it's from Car and Driver magazine from back in the 70s. Looking at different types of cars, their miles per gallon, number of cylinders, all sorts of different statistics that gearheads would get really excited about with different cars. We don't need to care <laughs> about the cars. What we care about is that there's a variety of different types of variables in here, continuous, categorical, 
um, all sorts of different things that we can use to again create minimal reproducible examples. Um, and so empty cars and other things like it are really nice because um, if I'm going to post my code, then I need to post data with it, right? And so the idea then is that if I use empty cars, I don't have to share my real data. One of the things I'll also comment on with reproducible examples is that it's very common that I might have 100 lines of code and I'm trying to solve a problem, right? Well, I'm not gonna post all 100 lines of code. I'm only gonna post what's really relevant. And as we said, that also goes for the data. Well, if I've got that 100 lines of code and I start chipping away at really isolating where is the problem or where is it that I'm struggling with, invariably, I get to a few lines of code and more often than not, I actually solve my problem, right? By trying to minimize things and simplify things, I can figure out where the problem is and solve it more directly. And if I can't solve it, well, then I have this minimal reproducible example. And in this case, it created the figure that we just looked at, but in other times it will create an error message. And so then the first step that somebody wanting to help me will do, as I've already shown you, is run this code to generate the figure or to generate the error message that I'm seeing. As I also said, it's often also helpful to point out to the people reading your thread what you want it to say, what do you want it to look like, what you want the output to appear like. So we've got this minimal reproducible example. And something I want to call your attention to is that RStudio actually publishes a number of cheat sheets. And so if you go to help, cheat sheets, you can see a variety of different cheat sheets here. They've got others that aren't in this menu, um, but I like the one that's data visualization with ggplot2. And actually, I don't just like this one, I like all of them. And back on campus, I have a stack of cheat sheets that I've printed off that I regularly thumb through to try to find the syntax that I'm after. You know, there's clearly just so many different functions and so many different options. And these cheat sheets are really helpful for kind of triggering my memory of what I'm trying to do and to get that syntax just right. So one thing that I want to call your attention to on this ggplot2 cheat sheet is in the bottom left corner of the first page, there's a little legend here showing you what plotting symbols correspond to what shape number. And if you look at symbols 21 through 25 here, you'll notice they appear a bit different than all the others. They are light blue on the inside and they have a darker blue border. These symbols, 21 through 25, allow you to use the fill aesthetic to change the interior color and the color aesthetic to change the exterior, the border of the plotting symbol. And so we are going to use shapes 21 and 24. Those are the bordered circle and triangle. And we'll also use 22, which is the square. And so by using these symbols, we can change, again, the interior color with the fill and the border color using the color aesthetic. So returning to our code, we can do scale, shape, manual, breaks, and we'll do three, four, and five for the number of gears. And then values, we'll do 21, 24, and 22. Again, that gives us the circle, the triangle, and the square. You'll notice though that these are not filled symbols, right? That we can kind of see through them. We can see the grid line that these are sitting on. And so we have mapped the carburetor variable, or whatever that means, uh, to the color. I'd really rather that be the fill, right? So I can say fill as character carb. Now I see the interior of the shape is one color and the border is black. I'd like to make these points a little bit bigger so it's easier for you to see. So I'm gonna go ahead and do geom point size equals three. Obviously our points are a bit bigger now, they're easier for us to see. And there's a couple things that we still have some work to do. So the first is, as the original poster commented, they wanted the squares to not have a border. Well, these have a border. A unique aesthetic that goes with symbols 21 through 25 is an aesthetic called the stroke. So you could do stroke equals two. This then gives us a thick border on our symbols, right? And so we could do 0 0.2 and get a more thin line, right? We could do 0 0.5 to get back to the default. What I'd like to do is to have a scale stroke manual. Unfortunately, there are no scale stroke anything functions that allow us to manipulate the stroke, the thickness of our border. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that aesthetic for now. And the trick that I'm going to do instead of that stroke, that scale stroke, whatever that doesn't exist, is I'm gonna map the number of gears to the color. So this is gonna take a couple steps, but bear with me. Again, we'll do color equals as dot character um, gear. 
And so now we see we've got different border colors for each of the three different plotting symbols, right? And so what we can then do, scale color manual, breaks, and we'll do three, four, and five again. And then our values, I'm gonna do black, black, and let's do red so it sticks out. And so now we see that the three and four gear cars have black borders, whereas the five gear cars have uh, their squares, but they have a red border. Now, I don't want red, right? The original poster didn't want any color there. So instead of red, I'm gonna use a function called RGB. And so RGB allows you to give the function a red, a green, a blue value between zero and 255 to get whatever color you want. You can also give it an alpha, which is the level of transparency. So I'm gonna do zero, 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 which I think is black, <laughs> and then I'll do alpha equals zero. And what that should do is that should give it a black border on those squares, but the alpha is going to be zero, which means that there will be no border. And so now what we can see is that we do have these squares, but they don't have a border around them, right? That's pretty slick, eh? One thing that I noticed though, is that by removing the border, those symbols get a little bit smaller. So what I'd like to do is let's use scale size manual to make the squares a bit bigger. So again, we'll do scale size manual, and we'll do breaks of three, four, and five. And then I'll do size equals three. Oh, I need to put that in the C function. So three, three, and four. And I'm gonna remove size from geom point. And I'm also going to then take that shape as um, character gear and also make that then size. Oh, and I have size here and I didn't mean size, I meant values. So now we see that our squares are a bit bigger than they were. They're more on the same size as our circles and our triangles. And of course they don't have a border. I think we've accomplished what the original poster wanted. However, if you look at the legend, there's a few problems here, which will allow us to look at some other features of these scale manual functions that will allow us to manipulate the way these legends appear. So specifically, if you look at this as character gear um, legend, you'll notice that the five is missing. And that's because again, the border is transparent, right? There's nothing there. So what I'd rather do is override these colors um, and these fills that I have for the different shapes and make them black, right? The other thing I'd like to do then is that if you look at my colors um, for my as character carb, they are all black, right? And so it's using the color aesthetic to set the color of these different colors. So I need to override these two legends to make them appear the way I want them to. To override the way those legends appear, I can come into each of the scale whatever manual and I can then do guide, guide legend. And we are now going to override AES. So that's the argument. And we'll then say list. We'll give it a list of values of arguments and their values. So I could say fill equals black and color equals black. So now we have the legend for the shapes looking pretty good. The next thing I wanna turn my attention to are the colors of the plotting symbols in this secondary legend. And again, they've all been turned to black. To change the color, I'm gonna add another scale. So we'll do scale fill manual. We'll do breaks equals um, one, two, three, four, six, and eight. Those were the six different carburetor values. I have no idea what those mean. And then for our values, I'm gonna use the rainbow function. We now see that our shapes in the plotting window have changed to different colors. But again, as we've seen, our fill colors or the colors in our legend are still all black. So again, we can override the guide by doing guide, guide legend, and then do override.aes, and we'll do list color equals rainbow uh, six. We now have those six different colors that correspond to the colors in the plot. Now, when I have done this in my work, where again, I have one variable getting mapped to the shape and another variable mapped to the color, it always makes me a little bit worried that my audience will be confused that I have a circle for three and then I have circles down here for my plotting shape in my color legend. I'd prefer to have a different shape for my color legend. So we can do that again down here in this override AES. Let's do shape equals 18. 
And that gives us diamonds. And so again, it's a shape that isn't being represented in our shape legend. Those are really small though. So why don't we go ahead and make those bigger? And again, we can do this in that same list function for the override AES. We'll do size equals five. And now we have basically a swatch for each of those six different colors that is a shape that doesn't overlap with the shapes that we're using for the three different gear levels. Again, what was most important to the original poster on that discussion thread was that the squares not have a border around them. There's probably a variety of other ways that you could do this. This is how I did it. Again, my strategy was to use those plotting symbols between 21 and 25, where you can set the fill color as well as the border color. Then for those symbols where I didn't want a border color, I made them transparent using the RGB function, setting that alpha value to zero. Along the way, we saw how we can use override AES within the guide legend function being passed to the guide argument for each of those scale manual functions to change the different ways that these legends appeared. I think you could generalize this to a lot of different applications. I know I have used this in some of my projects, as I mentioned earlier, where I've got different things being mapped to the shape as well as the color. Again, I hope you found this useful in thinking about how we can, of course, make this type of plot, but more importantly, thinking about going into these discussion forums and not just reading them for answers to help you with your coding, but really think about and take to heart the opportunity we have to teach others and to help other people overcome their problems. It's a fun challenge, and I find that I really learn a lot by trying to really dig in uh, to, to solving the poster's questions. Sometimes, uh, you know, the poster might say, well, that's not exactly what I wanted, right? And so you can have some give and take and some discussion. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and save this uh, image, and I will write a response that I will put a link to uh, in the description down below of this video. Um, and maybe I will put a link in the thread to this video so the, the poster can see a bit more of the discussion and my thought process that I went through as I went about creating this code. So again, I encourage you to dig into these different discussion forums. Always try to be supportive and helpful to the, uh, the posters. Don't be a jerk, no one likes that. Um, and, and, and really, this is a great way to improve your R skills, to take someone else's problem and to try to solve it. Again, go out there and try to find a problem and make our R community a better place for everybody.